Hi, my name is Chris Bailey, and this is a Maya to Blender first steps tutorial. So if you're a Maya Pro user and you wanna know how to get into Blender, this is the video for you. Let's get started. Now I use Maya all the time in my professional work, um, but I also use Blender all the time too. And Blender is my preferred tool. If I had to pick between using Maya, using Blender, I'd pick Blender every time. Now you might be wondering to yourself, why? Like, what's the big deal? Why, why is Blender a good tool to use? Well, let me show you. This right here is a short film that I've been working on in Blender. And this is a rendered image, as you can see, of one of the shots of the film, but it's also rendering live in my viewport. So I can jump out of my camera at any point here and zoom around my scene and get a closer look. I can turn in all my, my widgets, come in here and actually start posing my characters to be able to work this quickly and this smoothly and to be able to see everything in a live context is just mind blowing. I've got it down to so far, even cutting between shots here using markers on my timeline. So I'm able to map out and plan my entire short film, create it in this whole like rendered real time viewport. Here's another much simpler scene that's set up. But again, with the real time rendering, you can see I'm even getting real time depth of field. I can come in and begin to tweak materials in real time, changing things on the fly and getting actual results to see what the final render is gonna look like. Another advantage that Blender has is it's a really powerful uh, geometry node system, which is a really dynamic uh, system, a lot like something you'd run into in uh, Houdini, where everything is node-based and you can create really cool animation effects, modeling effects, procedural systems that you can then create assets. Um, it's a really powerful tool under the hood that's constantly being improved on. All right, so when you're starting out in Blender, you might wanna be using uh, hotkeys that you're familiar with, um, but you can get a hold of those by going into Edit Preferences. And we can come over here to Key Map, and you've got a different uh, presets here. We've got the Blender, we've got old old style, old school Blender, and then we've got the Industry Compatible. Industry Compatible is going to be um, very much like Maya. So it's gonna be um, holding down the Alt key, um, using F to focus, things like that. They'll all come back with that. But I would strongly encourage you, and I strongly encourage everyone to actually learn the Blender hotkeys. And one of the reasons for that is there is a wealth of information about Blender on the internet. So YouTube channels like this one, uh, tons of documentation and everything is gonna refer to the Blender hotkeys. And if you can learn the Blender hotkeys, you're gonna be far better off to be able to take advantage of all those resources. So Grin and Barrett, I would push in past that, you know, the the the, the pain of all, all that muscle memory that you have, just resist the alt key, just tape the alt key down and just keep your hands off it. You can do it, I believe in you. It's worth it in the long run if you can begin to wrap your head around it. So I'd encourage you to give it a try. So using the Blender standard hotkeys is what I'll be talking about today. And the main thing you wanna know is just to move around in your viewport, what you need to do is hold down the shift key and use the middle mouse button. This will uh, give you your, your movement around the scene. If you let go of the shift key, you can middle mouse click to orbit to move around and then rolling the mouse wheel zooms you in and out. And then if you wanna focus on something, instead of F, it's gonna be the full stop or the period key on your keypad and that will do the exact same thing and bring you in on the stuff. So those are kind of the main, you know, how to get around the viewport. But what are we looking at when we see this viewport? Some of the things that you might be confused about and uh, not make sense, right up at the top, we've got all these different tabs. Now these aren't shelves. So it's not like in Maya where we've got the different tools that we can have with the different shelves. These are actually just custom layouts for different windows. So I can jump in here and have different um, win preset windows that enable me to do different types of work within Blender. Likewise, you can come over here and create your own layouts, um, whatever you want. You can, you can create custom layouts and name them anything and save them in your own shelf up here at the top. Now, what's cool about that is that the windows in Blender are fully dynamic. So you can move all these things around, but you can also change any window into any other type of editor. So in the top left-hand corner of every single window, you've got this little icon. I can click it and this gives me all the different editors that are available within Blender, all the different spaces. You could think of these as different spaces. So I could switch here to 3D viewport and now suddenly I've got another viewport uh, available. Um, so I can have two different views. I could switch this to my timeline. So now I've got my timeline. You can, you can really set this to anything you want. Um, so it means that Blender is a really flexible environment to be able to set up uh, your workspace. You can also split views. So if you go into the bottom or, or the corners, basically of any window, you get this little plus symbol and I can come here and click and drag up to split a view this way. I can click and drag the other way to split a view that way. And I can get rid of views by doing the opposite. So get the plus, click and drag over uh, one of the windows and that will uh, get rid of it. So you can create really complex uh, layouts with a lot of different windows doing different types of things if you want. It's all there for you and it's easy to, to mess around with it. Don't worry about things crashing, it'll be fine. You can just go nuts with it. Some of the most important windows. So the outliner here, this is very much like the outliner you would have in uh, Maya, which you know, of course normally would be over here. 
And this gives us a layout of everything that's in our scene. All the different objects are listed here. Everything has to have a unique name, uh, just like in Maya. So we've got all of our different objects. But one thing that is a little bit different, you'll notice this thing here called a scene collection and a collection. Collections are basically like folders. Um, they're not groups. So this doesn't have any kind of 3D location in my scene. I can't change the translate or the rotation values of this, this collection. It just exists solely within my outliner. But they're really powerful. In this top right corner, I can clear, clear, create a new collection and I can have, you know, collection two, you can rename them anything you want. And I can, you know, drag objects in and enables me to then like turn off whole collections just to hide a bunch of stuff if I don't want it. Um, you can put all of your geometry in one collection and all of your lights in another one, for example, or have different lighting setups in different collections and turn them on and off as you want to view them. Uh, what's also cool is you can have uh, objects have multiple collections they belong to. So I could actually take this cube, so I can hold down control and uh, drag, and now this cube exists in both of these collections. So there's not two collections, uh, there's not two cubes, there's only one cube, and you can see it's highlighted when I select one, it highlights both, but I've got it in two separate collections. So I can organize stuff uh, really easily. You can also drag collections inside other collections. So think of them like folders. That's probably the best analogy, um, but don't think of them as groups. They're very different. Now, if you did want to group some objects, there isn't really a similar system of selecting multiple objects and you know, control G to group them together. Uh, what you need to do is actually create an object in the scene and parent things to it. Come over to my viewport and hit Shift A, which is the quick menu for adding objects into my scene. Um, I can come over here and add another you know, cube or a UV sphere, let's say. And if I wanted to group these objects together, I would need to either parent this sphere to the the cube itself, or typically if you want to have a similar uh, functionality to what you have in Maya, you would want to then create shift A, go empty, plane axis empty. Um, this is just a null, basically that's just an empty, uh, just a position, a 3D position and rotation uh, within 3D space. It also has scale values as well, but there's no geometry associated with this. But I can select, shift select these guys, and then shift select this, control P to parent, and parent these, and now they are parented to this null, and I can do whatever I want to with it and these guys are gonna follow along. And you can see it lives over here in this kind of uh, sort of layout that's very similar to what you would expect with a group. Now, some of the uh, like really most important things you need to know, um, moving things around in Blender, there's a really good hotkey system for this. So instead of using the W, E, and the R keys to switch between rotation, translation, and scale, we have different hotkeys. And I really want you to encourage you to, to learn these, okay? Because they get really fast as you use them more and more. The G key, G stands for grab. So when you want to grab something, not move something, you hit G and you can grab it around. But what's so great about it is you can then hit, once G is active, and you can see it's kind of locked to my mouse, I can hit X and it will lock it on the X axis. Or I can hit Y, it'll lock it on the Y axis, or Z, lock it on the Z axis. And this is an important point as well. You see Z is up and down in Blender. So if you're used to Y being up and down, just get used to seeing Z as the up and down when you're in Blender. Um, you can correct for that when you export, for example, an FBX. Uh, you can export stuff and say, look, I want Y to be up so that you can easily move between uh, Maya and Blender with your project files if you need to. So that's not a problem. Same with scale. So it's S to scale, um, but I can also lock it on the X or I can lock it on the Y or the Z. Um, and then R is for rotate. And once again, you can lock the axis, which is really powerful. You can also do some cool stuff like holding down shift and selecting an axis. So if I hit G, hold down shift and hit Z, it will turn off the Z um, location uh, movement. And I'm just grabbing it along the X and the Y. You can see just the X and Y are highlighted. One last thing that's gonna really drive you nuts, you're gonna hit W at some point when trying to move something. So you're gonna grab an object, you're gonna hit W and your cursor is gonna change into this mode and you won't be able to get it back. And it's a bit weird and confusing. So. Actually, what W does is it changes your selection mode. So you can see right here in the corner, W actually changes your selection mode. So if this ever happens to you, you hit W and you're trying to move something, just go over here, click, hold, switch it back to tweak, you'll be good to go. Now, what's beautiful about that is that these hotkeys, the G for grab, R for rotate, F, S for scale, you can you can use that same conceit in pretty much every window. So uh, I could come here, right? And if I set a keyframe for my uh, cube here, let's say, so I'll hit I and set a location keyframe and then go forward a little bit, bring him over here, rotate him, and I'll set keyframes by hitting I over these. Um, and I'll come back and let's just rotate them again over here. I can click on these keyframes in my timeline and I can hit G to grab to move them around. I can also select multiple keyframes, hit S to scale, and it will pivot based on wherever my playhead is. So you can see I can scale those keyframes here. Likewise, I could switch over to the graph editor and it's gonna be very familiar to you. The graph editor is quite good here in Blender as well. Um, and we can scale 
actual individual handles. We can rotate them and we can G to grab. We can also lock on the Y axis or the X axis. So you see you don't have the functionality up here, the buttons to constrain to the X or Y um, plane. All you have to do is just hit that within uh, the hotkeys and you get the same functionality. Now, a couple of things that I think are really useful to know if you're coming from Maya, going into Blender about the graph editor. Let me just show you over here. If you go up to edit preferences and we go to animation, Right here, we've got F curves. We have the unselected opacity. Uh, by default, Blender is set to one. So every everything, even the cur curves that aren't selected are full opacity. I can drag this down. I like to really bring this down so they're quite dim. So it's really clear which one's selected. Um, I'll, I'll close that out. And another thing that's really, really useful is that by default, whatever curve you click on is gonna be uh, the one that you select. And this can be a bit of a problem when you've got keyframes in the same position. Like for example, if I have this uh, Z uh, location here and my X, if I'm clicking and I want to grab the Z, I'm like click to grab the X and up oh, it switches me over to Z. This can be really frustrating for a my user if you're not used to this functionality. I would encourage anyone, even Blender users to change this by just going to view and select only selected uh, curve keyframes. Now it's going to mimic Maya where you can select the channel and that's now the only thing that enables you to select a keyframe. So it doesn't matter what keyframes exist here on what curves, if they're in the same position, I can still grab and move them around. So that's all pretty good. So again, with um, keyframes, you know, you can use the same uh, hotkeys using the viewport. So I can select all with A and then hit full stop to zoom to view this, or I could select all my channels like this and hit A to select all and full stop. And that will zoom everything. You can also hold down control just to change your your zoom uh, in the different different axes um, within this view. So um, now what we can do is we can come in here and you know grab multiple keyframes and we can scale along the X. If I hit X to constrain and now you can see I'm able to just change my the timing of my keyframes again using the playhead as the pivot point. Um, and you can change that. You can actually come over here and change it from instead of bounding box center, which is the default, which will do it right around the playhead. You can have um, other ones like individual centers. So if I select that and scaling the X, you can see the keyframe stay still and now it's just gonna be scaling the handles. You can also right click any keyframe like you would in Maya and change the interpolation mode. So constant, linear, we've also got some other cool ones. Bear in mind that whenever you have selected, whenever you deselect it, it's gonna disappear from your timeline and from your graph editor. And that's because by default, this button right here is turned on, which is only shows selected. So if I turn that off, well now show me everything that has animation in my scene all the curves, everything stays up. So you can use that to kind of focus in um, on stuff. Now, if you wanted to edit some mesh, let's say you're, you're working in this cube, you want to extrude some, there's no right click menu to get to the edit mode um, or be able to edit faces and edges and stuff. In Blender, it sort of lives as a separate, uh, a separate workflow, separate um, state, I guess you could say. So if I hit tab, uh, I'll go into edit mode. And now I've got these options up here. I've got the vertex, edge, and face mode. I can switch between these, I can grab them, and now I can have all the functionality I'm used to having. Um, once I get the hotkeys down, you've also got these handy tools down here just for icons you can use to and do things like extrude. Um, they're quite easy to work with, uh, inset, stuff like that. But we also have all the hotkeys as well. And you can use the X, Y, and Z to constrain um, your axis, so whenever you're um, extruding out, you can extrude in whatever direction you want. Um, it's very, very easy to switch between. When you're done editing, you hit tab to go out of edit mode. Now, if you notice up here, uh, object mode, this little drop down, these are all the different modes. So you can switch between them here manually. Um, something I like to do is come up here to edit preferences, key map, and turn on tab for Pi menu. And this allows you to just hit tab to get this pie menu. You can select all the different modes. Now, if you're working with a rig, uh, it's important to note that in Blender, rigs or armatures, bones, all that stuff, they, they live as an object in your scene, okay? So you don't just directly click on the bones and start controlling them. What you do when you click on a bone, you actually end up clicking on the armature object. You can see right up here, this droid rig is an armature object. There's a different mode in Blender and it's called pose mode. It's you have to switch into that first before you can pose bones. So we can go over here from object mode. And when I have a rig selected, you'll see I get some new options. If I had the mesh selected, if I go up here, I'm not gonna get those options. So it's just if you have an armature picked, um, you come up here and we go into pose mode. Now I can pose my character. One thing about this is if I have any other objects in my scene, let's say I have like an object, like a, some set pieces or something, 
and I'm in pose mode and I'm posing my object and stuff and I want to click on something else, it won't let me. So Blender forces me to stay in pose mode. So all I can select while I'm in pose mode are these bones. Um, now this can be a little frustrating um, if you're not used to this. Uh, so there is one setting that you can change that will make this a little bit more like Maya, but not entirely. So if you come up here to edit, you can turn off lock object modes. And what that's going to do is basically um, whenever you're in pose mode now, if you click on something else, it's going to automatically let you select it and it'll switch the mode to what's appropriate. The downside of this is that um, if you've got multiple characters in your scene, multiple armatures, when you select it, um, if you put them all into pose mode, uh, you'll be able to select their bones, but they'll all be active at the same time. So if I hit A to select all, for example, it will select all the bones in all the characters that are in pose mode. So it's not quite like it would be in what you would expect in Maya, but this is a good workaround at least to kind of make it more familiar um, until you're getting used to the idea of pose mode being a separate space. So for example, if I was to go shift A and go here to armature and create an armature, you can see this new armature object, uh, if I just grab it over here, it's just a single bone. You can unfold these armatures to see what's inside them so you can see the different bones. Now, if I go into edit mode, this is different from pose mode. So edit mode is where I can sort of create my rig and my bone structure, let's say. Then I can switch into pose mode and pose mode is where I pose the, the bones, right? So the idea is you create the armature, the base rig, and it's sort of T-pose in edit mode. You get that all set up, you get it constrained to your object get everything working. And then when it's time to animate, you're switching into pose mode. Now, let's say you're, you're doing some work and you want to figure out how to do something. And you're like, I know what it's called in Maya. I know how to do this thing in Maya, but I don't know how to do it in Blender. Uh, you know, let's say you want to duplicate this object. It's like, how do I duplicate? Thankfully, Blender has got a very powerful uh, tool search functionality. So if you hit F3, this is going to be like your favorite key. Hit F3 and you can type anything in. So let's type in duplicate. And you can see we get a couple of options and it'll show you where it lives. So object, duplicate objects. So this is referring to the, um, the menu. So up here you can see object is one of the menus in object mode. So I could select object and in the drop down I could find duplicate objects. It also will tell you the shift, the um, hotkey if there is one. So shift D duplicates. So I can do that now and I've got another, uh, another cube here that I've created. But you can do this for anything and thankfully it's uh, not, it doesn't have to be exact. You don't have to spell it right. You don't have to get it in the right order. You can kind of just, you know, um, roughly guess, you know, what, what could it be called? And it will give you all the different things that have these letters within the name. So it's a really, really powerful way of, of learning not only the hotkeys, but learning what it is you can do in Blender and how to find it. So now if I wanted to change my orientation, so right now we're in global, um, I can turn on my widgets here so you can see these, which is, you know, of course, very familiar if you're in Maya, um, very similar widgets like you would have. You can turn these on manually just with this little uh, menu off to the side. Um, and be in mind, uh, every window in Blender has got these sort of side windows. You can actually um, drag these guys and hide them. You can see there's one here and you can bring them out by uh, grabbing and bring them back in. You can see that little arrow icon just above my mouse. That's the clue that there's one of those menus hiding. So um, you can see like, for example, here, if I drag those icons, I can hide them and I can bring them back. You can also use the N key and the T key to bring them back. So it's very uh, very easy to, to, to hide things if you don't want to see them. Um, so I'm going to hide that one. So I've got my uh, my widgets here. You can see I'm in global uh, mode right now, my orientation. So I can come up here to the top and just switch this. This is where you have all the different uh, translation sort of orientation modes. So I can switch to local now and work within the local space, or I could you know have a face in edit mode, for example, and you know grab this face, which is a weird angle, and I could set this instead of local to normal, and now I can grab and move it along its normal. So that's uh, how you could do that. Likewise, we've got the different um, pivot modes. And this brings up one of the cool features of Blender, which you don't have in Maya, the 3D cursor. The 3D cursor is quite powerful. So 3D cursor is this thing right here. And we can move it around and place it in different spots to do stuff. So what I could do here, for example, let's say I wanted to uh, move this sphere to be right here where this vertex is on this bottom corner. So I could go into edit mode. I could switch to vertex mode, select that vertex. And then I could do the hotkey shift S. If I didn't know the hotkey, I could type F3 and type in cursor. And I could see all the things that do stuff with the cursor. And I want to snap the cursor. So I'm going to go snap cursor to active. Let's do that cursor to active. Now the 3D cursor is in the exact 3D position of this, uh, this vertex. Now, if I go out of edit mode and object mode, 
I can select this object and I can type F3 and snap selection to cursor. There it is. You can see it gives me the key, for, uh, the hotkey as well, Shift S. So if I go Shift S, get my radial menu here, I can pick what I want. And I'm going to take the selection, so the selected object, and I'm going to move it to the cursor. So now, bam, that's going to move that over here. Kind of think of it as like a null or an empty that lives in your scene permanently and you can use it to position things. It's also the place where new objects will be created. So I could come over here, let's say, and I could shift S cursor to selected. So now this cursor is at the origin of this object and I can go shift A and let's create a mesh uh, isosphere and I can scale that up so we can see it. And it's positioned that isosphere right there. So whenever you create a new object, it always puts it at the position of the 3D cursor. Moving along the top, we've got the magnet up here. This is for snapping. We've got all these different types of snapping, which is you know pretty self-explanatory. So you can position things with snapping. It works in edit mode as well. We have proportional editing, which is a really cool tool. If I go into edit here, edit mode, I can select one of these vertexes, let's say, and hit uh, G, but I'll turn on my proportional editing. And I get this circle and I can roll my mouse wheel to expand it. We also have different view modes and stuff. We can hide things just like you had in Maya. Um, and we have our uh, gizmos button here with all different uh, gizmos and their view stuff. And then also with the um, the overlays, um, these are all the different ways you can turn off like the floor, the 3D access, things like that. Um, likewise, you have transparent mode for selecting hidden vertexes and stuff. If you're in edit mode, and you're trying to do some work and you want to make sure you're selecting everything. That's a good way to do it. And then we have our view modes. We've got our wireframe mode, flat shaded mode, um, and the material shaded mode, and then we have the rendered view. And the rendered view is going to switch us into Eevee, which is the real-time render engine for Blender. I'll just come here, I'll turn off scene world so we can get a built-in HDRI, and I'll just turn in, turn up my world opacity so you can see it. And you can see it's coloring my scene, it's creating lighting for me, it's doing some really great stuff. I can see my real-time lighting and shadows here. All those settings live over here. Now, this is another kind of really important thing to uh, understand about Blender, and it's this section over here, the properties panel. So in Maya, when you select an object, you know, in your outliner, you get the properties for that object. Then you also have the attribute editor and things like that. The equivalent of all that stuff lives here in these different tabs. So these tabs give you all that information. If you select an object, um, you'll see you get different options depending on the type of object. So if I select this light, I'll get a new light tab and there's a few less options. So they always relate to the object you have selected. The top ones here uh, from this little camera down to this world icon, these um, aren't relating to the object, they're relating to the whole scene. So this is your render settings, what render engine you want to use, and different things you want to be doing. If you're using Eevee, I'd recommend turning on Bloom, Ambient Occlusion, and Screen Space Reflections. They're not really going to hit your performance, and it's going to make things look really nice. Um, if you switch down, you've got the printer icon, which is the output uh, settings for your scene where you can save. Um, we've got uh, render layers and stuff. We're doing compositing. And then we have some scene information here where you can change things like the units. Uh, if you want to use a different system for the metric, or you can match, you know, Maya's unit scale specifically, if you wanted to be going back and forth, um, that's all really handy. And then you have some stuff for dynamics and rigid, rigid body systems. Then you have the world, which is the world shader. So what shader are we using in our world? Um, we'll talk about shaders in a moment. And then we've got a collection tab here, which gives us information about the collection that we have um, that's uh, relating to the object that we have selected. So in these, we've got our main transform controls here under the orange box, so we can set the different you know, location rotation transforms, the scale transforms for the object that we have selected. So if I select this isosphere, you can see I can uh, just change the scale here directly. The next tab down is modifiers, and this gives us some really cool stuff like an array modifier. These are basically like non-destructive uh, little tools that you can use to do all kinds of wild and wacky things in your scene with your objects. You can stack these up. So I could put like a subdivision surface here to get a smooth uh, subdivisions on my object. I can turn up the number of subdivisions. And also too, they're affected by what order they're in. So you can stack them in cool ways to do really interesting dynamic stuff that's non-destructive. So we can just turn those off. Particles uh, allows us to emanate, uh, like emit particles from an object. Um, and you can set those up here um, with the plus symbol adds a new particle system. And now suddenly we've got particles flying around in our scene. And we've got all those settings that appear there. And then we've got uh, our um, physics tab. So this allows us to do things like, you know, turn this guy into a fluid or make him a cloth or allow him to, to collide with stuff. Keep going down, we've got constraints. And these are all the different types of constraints. So there's no constraint menu. You're going to add a constraint to an object, kind of like a modifier. So let's say I want to take this object and give it a, um, you know, dampen track constraint to always look at the isosphere. 
Now I can move this isosphere around and this guy's gonna constantly be constrained to look at that isosphere and you've got all the controls there. So object data is a bit more specific to the individual data within um, an object. So things like the UV maps live here, shape keys, vertex groups. This is where you can find all of those. And then we've got the material tab, which you can see we already have a default material that's applied. So say you've got an object selected and you're like, look, I just wanna apply a default Lambert shader. How would I do that in Blender? Well, you can select the object and uh, come to the material tab and you just click new and this will create a new material. You can call it, you know, whatever you want. And um, it sets it up here for you. Now this is automatically gonna default to the principal BSDF. So the, um, the you know, the realistic uh, shader. If you click on surface, you've got a drop down menu of all the different types of shaders. So you could do something simpler. You could just do a straight up diffuse BSDF if you don't wanna have a lot, but I find that the overhead isn't really that um, expensive. So, you know, you can really just leave this on the principal BSDF and uh, it'll work It'll work really well. So when you wanna work on a shader, you can edit things in here, but it's not as um, easy. It's a bit bit cumbersome here uh, using it within this side. So I, I like to bring up the shader editor. And this is kind of like the hypergraph, uh, but not quite. Um, it's nodal based and uh, whatever shader you have selected in the list, you have multiple shaders in this object. Let's say we had a few you know, different shaders here. Um, whichever one you have selected is the one that will be displayed here. Um, you've got this drop down menu as well, which you can select them from. And this allows you to you know, create all kinds of stuff. And you can come in here and add nodes um, for different types of you know, noise, uh, effects, all kinds of procedural stuff. And you can uh, use these to create some really interesting shaders. Um, also too, if you wanna get rid of the faceted look uh, where you see each normal kind of rendered as a hard edged object, you can select objects and right click shade smooth. Um, and that will shade them as smooth. Um, you can also switch back easily. So everything's pretty much uh, animatable in Blender. Um, you can really, any of these inputs you can animate and it's very simple to do so. If we can switch this one, let's say, let's switch this to 4D, which would give us this W value and uh, I can drag it and you can see that when as I drag it, I'm getting you know variation in my in this procedural shader. So you know I could right click on this guy and I could insert a keyframe. I could also use the hotkey I and just set a keyframe there and I could go forward a little bit of my timeline by pressing the space bar, which is play in Blender. If I bring my timeline back up here, just by creating a split view, um, you can see I've got a keyframe that's appeared just like it looks in Maya. In my timeline, I can hit G and grab this around. I can come forward a bit. I could move this guy forward some, set a new keyframe with I, and now you can see it's gonna animate between the two. Um, now you also have the GPU renderer, which is cycles. You can just switch this by going to the camera tab, switching over to cycles. Um, and uh, it's gonna be a, an actual ray traced, uh, you know, really high end uh, GPU renderer. It's really beautiful. But I find Eevee often uh, does the trick. Now, as I said before, spacebar is the play button. So it plays your timeline. So if you wanna actually split your view or jump between different uh, view splits, that's where you need to set up different um, layouts up here or do your, your splits this way to then set up you know, individual shots or individual layouts. So if I wanted to like look at this from the top view, so I come up here to view and I can go to viewport and you can see we've got this number pad seven, control seven, all these different hotkeys. These are the hotkeys you can use to jump between different views. So you can use your number keypad to change those different orthographic or perspective um, uh, views. You can also jump into the camera by either clicking on this camera icon to jump inside or what you can do is hit the zero on your number keypad and that will also jump into a camera. That's really useful. One last thing, well, two last things I think that are really great to know about. I open up the side thing and I go to view. Right here under view lock, I can lock my camera to view. So if I tick on that box, that means that now wherever I move my view, my camera is gonna come with me. This is really great for framing up shots. Very, very handy. Um, another thing that's very useful is the quick menu, the quick selection menu. You can take any property and right click on it and you can add it to quick favorites. So I could go to this, you know, lock to 3D cursor and I could add that to my quick favorites. Um, I could add anything I want to my quick favorites. And then if I hit Q in the viewport, it's gonna give me all the things that I've put there. So I can easily, for example, lock my camera to view. I can turn that off and jump out of my camera. I can turn it back on, jump into my camera. And now I'm once again, moving my camera. So uh, really, really useful because you can set that up for every window. Uh, so you've got a lot of different workflows you could use there, which are really useful. So well, there you have it. I hope you found this intro to Blender really helpful and that it makes sense in your Maya brain, being able to translate over to how things work 
here in Blender. If anything didn't make sense or you have more questions, please leave a comment below. Don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed the video and subscribe to this channel if you'd like to learn more about Blender, especially if you're interested in making short films. That's a big focus of this channel. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next tutorial. Until then, have a fantastic week.